Way to go. Keep it going. Good job, guys. All right, Paul. Let's see you. Hey there, it's Coach Curl here and welcome to episode 253 of the Today's Leader podcast. The, this episode of the Today's Leader podcast is just one of those times where you do truly count your blessings. Now, I've been privileged to interview some amazing leaders from right around the world and today is absolutely no different. Robert Bo Brabo is today's guest and this is interview was far reaching. Now before I get into it, before I get started, if you haven't already checked out the Today's Leader platform at todaysleader.com.au, please do so. Uh, Go check it out. It's got our full list of podcast episodes that have been available. We've got some blog articles and we also got the information in and around the Mastermind series that we will be running during 2021. Let's get it done in 2021. And of course, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast and we always love and appreciate reviews. Now, throughout his career, Robert Bo Brabo has always focused on the people, helping them tackle challenges as if they were their own. Now, since retiring, so, so wait for this, since retiring from the U.S. Army as the Chief of HR Operations with the White House Communications Agency and as a Presidential Communications Officer for both President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama, Bo has served in several executive positions and today Bo is an inspirational keynote speaker, career leadership executive coach, business consultant, and also hosts his own podcast. Military service, White House operations. This episode just blew my mind. So during the during the course of the conversation, Bo and I discussed values-based leadership and getting the right fit from for your team, how values-based businesses gain greater engagement, and as an outcome of that, create greater profits. He shares the zero defect environment that is at the White House and the leadership that is required because you get one shot at it, one shot. Uh, he, he really does uh, share an insightful story about caring for your unit and he uses a great example from his military background Uh, We also find out during the course of the conversation why leaders should speak last. He encompasses a a fail-forward approach and you'll also get some great insight when Bo shares his thoughts around the action um, after-action review. So Bo was nicknamed Bo because there were already too many Bobs in his family, so it became Bo. And as you'll notice very soon, I broke... (laughs) the bow mode um, in my first sentence welcoming him to the podcast. But Bo is a great sport and uh, we continued on. It's not every day you share a discussion with a leader with the pedigree of Bo's. And after this word from our network partners, please join me in welcoming Bo Brabo to the podcast. The podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, Get serious and join a mastermind group today. Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the Today's Leader podcast. I have Robert Bo Brevo. How are you, Bob? I'm doing great. And I've I've already made the first mistake. (laughs) Bob, how did that slip in? Let's call him. Yeah. Okay. How are you, Bo? I'm doing great, Tony. Thank you for having me. So share with the listeners a little bit uh-huh. of the Bo Bravo story. Sure. Uh, happy to. So as Tony said, my name is Bo Bravo. Uh, I'm in the United States. Uh, I spent a career in the United States Army, almost 26 years, uh, of which 10 of that, I had the honor of serving in the White House uh, under two different administrations, President uh, George uh, W. Bush and President Obama. 
Uh, and within that, I was the, I was the head of human resources uh, over operations, uh, HR operations. But I also had the opportunity to, to be trained as and lead teams uh, as a communications officer. So I uh, got fully trained, qualified, and it was like an additional part of my job uh, in addition to the full-time job, uh, which was leading those teams. And we'd go to events around Washington, D.C., around the country, uh, prepping for the president's arrival. Uh, and, and we would take care of all of the communications infrastructure wherever he was visiting uh, for the Secret Service, the White House staff, and for our teams, uh, getting everything ready for the president to arrive and give his speech or whatever he was doing, where he was coming. Uh, then I retired uh, from the Army in 2013 and went into the corporate world uh, and landed, landed some VP of HR type of roles uh, when I retired and I started my own company doing recruiting and staffing. Then I got into healthcare, uh, mergers and acquisitions, private equity. So I got a real taste of what, um, what the boardroom, if you will, was like, yeah. uh, which, is, which for us is, or for me, is, is reflective of corporate America. Uh, so I wrote a book. I tried to capture it all in the book uh, <laughs> from, from my time in Iraq and on the battlefield to the White House and then into corporate America and really kind of gauging uh, leadership and comparing leadership and what are, the, what are those attributes uh, that we can bring from the military into the corporate world to really help companies thrive. Absolutely. And your book's called From the Battlefield to the White House to the Boardroom, Leading Organizations to Values-Based Results. And as a member of the John, I'm a member of the John Maxwell team, and we are very focused on values-based leadership. So um, tell me about why it is that that's so important to you. Uh, it's, it's, it all came about when I, when I got the idea to write, to write the book and have that subtitle, you know, it's a, it's more than just my story. It's taking yeah. my story and applying it to that theme, um, which you mentioned leading organizations to values-based results. And I had the greatest example uh, I could think of, which was the United States army. Yeah. We, an organization that goes back to the 1700s and we had, and they still do very defined values and what the, all the behaviors around those values really mean and what they are. And uh, I decided that when I got out into corporate America and went through some different companies and the values just kind of seem to be loose, they're not defined, who knows what they are. We just kind of go about our business every day. Uh, I, like, I, was, I was just thinking that this is a real uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to take, the, take everything that I had learned, witnessed, uh, developed and the way I perform my own leadership in accordance with a very strong set of organizational values like the army values and how a company could take those values. And if they had no others, Tony, here, you can use the army values. You can take <laughs> these. Here's what they are. Here's how they're defined. Yeah. And, and see how those might fit your organization just to get an idea, right? Of what does this really mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's how I got into all of that. Um, yeah, because I think, I think soldiers, um, we lived it. Yeah. We lived those values, breathed them every day. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. Those are the seven army values. Yeah. And you could apply that to life. Absolutely. And yeah. So that's kind of what drove it all. And I, and I guess in the army, there's a, that life or death aspect in some respects in respect to the values. But from my experience with values-based leadership, there are organizations that have values and live them and you can breathe them and smell them mm -hmm. and feel them. And then there are other organizations that have the plaque on the wall, but then the culture right. and the feeling within the organization is vastly different. Is that right. from your experience as well? Is that what you've seen? That's exactly, that's exactly what I've seen. And, I, and I, that's right on point. Uh, when you get into an organization, it's very, especially if you have a, a, a pretty vast leadership background and you know what those things are and, and how values-based leadership plays a real role. So as soon as you see some titles on the wall or, or words up on the wall, and then you don't see behaviors that emulate those words, yeah. oh, you, you, it just rises to the top super quick. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so then it's... Um, then it's a challenge, 
right? Because you're trying to figure out, especially if you're an employee in the organization, how does how does this all fit together? Yeah, you know, or are they just are they just there for uh, show and tell? Yeah, it's a, there's a real obvious disconnect in so many in so many places. And from your experience, so, so how you use this with clients? So because mm-hmm. one of the questions I get asked often is, who's responsible for living the values? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> but then, but it has to, everybody. But it starts from the top. Absolutely. So, Right. So it starts with, and we'll just say the top person, the, the chief executive officer, the C-suite team, uh, it starts with them. They have, to, uh, they have to live and breathe those values. And, you know, the organizations, like you mentioned earlier, those that really do it well, I think that ha- that's a sign of leadership, really knowing who they are as individuals. Yeah. And bringing all that out in their daily work life and saying, hey, this is, this is who we are. This is the team that we are. This is how we be- behave. This is what we believe in. Uh, and then they, they, they motivate and influence others in their organization. And this, this is how they want people to behave. These are the type of behaviors that we want to see. And then they push that down through all their mm-hmm. departments, through hiring managers, uh, supervisors, you know, down to the lowest level. So, so when they're looking even for bringing in top talent or new talent into the organization, they've, those are the organizations that have done their due diligence in defining what type of questions do you ask people, Yeah. right? Behavioral questions where they want to see, are these people going to answer and give answers that would say, yep, they're a good fit. We don't have to tell them what our values are because based on what they're saying and their own beliefs, they might be a good fit for this organization or not. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so many people discount values and it's something that really, you know, and, and I say that in respect of some for people, some people it's business is business, but you know, yeah. at the end of the day, there's always a people element that we need to enhance and live to actually right. make our business great. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is, I think that is on point for sure. When I was doing research for, uh, my book, um, well, part of that research, uh, and I mentioned him in the book, was a gentleman I met uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, while I was studying at the university. His name is Dan Dennison. And uh, his, it's like a boutique consulting company, but he, he competes with the big guys, the big consulting companies. Yeah. And, and they do a lot of values-based uh, research. And, and he had just a ton of data um, where they've studied organizations that really do have a values-based leadership approach. Yeah, I mean, driving it right to the bottom line, increased profits, sales, um, less turnover, um, happier employees, more engaged employees, satisfied. So I think there's a t- there's plenty of data out there to support it. It's just getting getting those to, to really buy into like, hey, this is something we need to spend time on uh, to improve our company. Absolutely. And you've got a fascinating story, military, White House. I mean, just the White House yeah. itself is just, uh, we're, I'm based in Australia and just to understand the complexities around that particular role so it would be like a podcast series by itself i'm sort of guessing but in in respect of your story how do you use that to work with your clients so you've got to focus Mm -hmm. on values-based leadership so how do you then work with clients who really want to enhance and embrace this uh well i definitely use that experience in helping identify uh, and explain to people um, yeah. what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, and that type of environment uh, at the White House, is, if you can imagine, and I'm sure listeners can imagine, and it's stuff I do speaking engagements on too. Um, you, it's an environment like no other that I had ever experienced in my life. I mean, it's the president of the United States. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a, we always said it's a zero defect environment. Yeah. Uh, you can't, you don't have the luxury of screwing up. There's mm-hmm. no, uh, if the president's coming, wherever he's going, he could be going to Australia um, to give a speech where we're going to have a team there a couple weeks before he arrives. And when he arrives uh, to give his speech uh, and think about the, the plane comes in, but by the time he comes in, all the secret service, the security, everything's been put in place. All the communications have been put in place to cover from the, from the airport to wherever he's going in the surrounding areas, so everything can be talked uh, in a secure format. Uh, and that was all the teams I used to lead um, their jobs. It's our jobs to do that and get that all set up. 
Uh, but then when that president, when the president steps up to the microphone to talk, there's no rehearsal. He's not saying, Hey, you know, check one, two, check one, two, three. No, it's got to work. First time, first time go. Um, teleprompters have to be working script. Yeah. You know, the speech has to be set. Uh, there's no practice with the president. It's, wow. it's game on. Um, yeah. I've never been in it. I had never been in any other environment quite like that. Yeah. Uh, so I use that. I use that a lot, Tony, when I help people and, and executives um, prioritize uh, in their business world or even, even in their leadership uh, and helping define your priorities and ensuring that um, anything that doesn't fit into those priorities, their distractions and how to deflect those and hand them off to other people. Uh, so, you know, that might be a value of, um, you know, empowerment you know, and trying to explain why it's important to empower others. Like you don't yeah. need to micromanage and do everything yourself yeah. um, because you're going to have, you're going to have all these things coming at you and you need to learn how to deflect, yeah. uh, delegate, yeah. let others in your organization who, who can handle those things, handle those things. Um, and it's all about, yeah, behaviors and, you know, um, just getting after it. I'm I'm just thinking about the complexity of just that whole situation of having the president speak here in Australia. Yeah. And so you've got a team, it's a zero defect um, attitude or policy or procedure. And one person just can't do all that. So if no. you don't have your team aligned <laughs> to what the outcome is going to be and, yeah. and buying into the process, um, there's going to be a defect along the way, I would imagine. Yeah, so. you're absolutely right. And it's a, it's, a, it's a significant team. You know, you're probably talking for an overseas type of event like that, at least 30 people from the communications team. And then you wow. got the security team and it's a big event. And I, I explain it to folks um, because even here, even here in the United States, you only get so much information about the White House and how it works. And, it, and it's not classified information. It says you don't even know to look for it and say, like, yeah. how does all this stuff, how does this event even get pulled off, right? Yeah. Um, it's like take your most famous rock band or musician. And when they do a, a tour, there are semi-trucks of equipment and logistics that, get, um, that go around the country go to each place. There's these monster crews that have to set up the stages and all of that. It's the same. It's the exact same thing for, uh, for the president. And yeah, so your teams have to be spot on and it's, you know, you you can't, um, you can't delay. There's no not hitting a milestone or not hitting, you know, something that has to be done by a specific day. So there's lots of checklists. There's lots of meetings and leadership meetings and, making sure everybody's on the same page. Um, so uh, when you think about um, duty, you know, which is one of the army values, I mean, influencing that and ensuring people are living by that, you know, you have, you wake up every morning and you have a duty to uh, execute that day and it has to be done that day. You can't yeah. push it off to the next day or, or whatever. Yeah. And everybody has those duties. Yeah. So there's no excess people, uh, to give your work to. And, and once again, just a really good lesson for people to make sure that what we've got to get done today gets done today. And, and, um, you know, one of the insidious words that I see from leaders is the word later. We'll do that later. We'll do that later. Well, if it's something that should be relevant and should be done today, it should be done today. So, so Bo, who's inspired you in your leadership journey? You know, I was very fortunate, um, and, and it's, it's no one, it's no one famous, um, uh, growing up in the military, one of the best, uh, I had numerous great leaders, um, but one of the best, and he was a, he was a young guy. So when I, I went to Germany, I was at the white house, um, for a few years. And then I left, uh, I went to Germany for a tour uh, for three years. And part of that was going to combat, uh, in Iraq during operation Iraqi freedom, uh, and when I got to that location in Germany, uh, I had a young, I think he was 26 or 27 years old at the time. So I was older than, I was a little older than he was. Uh, he was a captain, uh, but he was our commander and his name was Tony Pirelli. And he, he just, he just got it from a leadership perspective. And most of all, he knew how to take care of people. And, you know, one of the greatest aspects I believe of, of leadership in general, uh, and I, in others say it, you just, 
you like to actually witness it and feel yeah. it and know that it's happening is caring, yeah. caring about your people. And even though he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, knowing that he was going to take, um, oh, geez, four or five months after I arrived, he was going to take this unit of 70 or 80 soldiers and he was going to lead them into Iraq. Um, the pressure of that on a very, on a very young man, uh, even with all of that, caring, caring about me and making sure that here I am moving to a foreign country, that I had a place to stay, mm -hmm. that um, my family was taken care of, that you know, there was transportation and, and just getting us settled so that then I could get settled and make sure everything's taken care of and, and then the family's taken care of and then get to work. Um, I, that was the first time I had ever experienced that level of care. Wow. Uh, yeah. So th that stuck with me. I mean, when people do things right, they stick with you, you grab mm -hmm. onto that. Um, and then uh, commander, I had a commander um, at the White House while I was there. And I think what I witnessed from him was he was the gentleman who would, uh, who would sit in the conference room and let everybody talk and hear what everybody had to say before he spoke. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you knew he was really listening and wanted to hear what you had to say. He wanted your input. Uh, and that was pretty special. You know, yeah. I hear all, you see all kinds of stories. I've had, I've had examples in corporate America where I walk into the, walk into the conference room of executives and the CEO talks for 25 minutes out of the 30 minute meeting. Yeah. And you kind of wonder, uh, okay, you know, I guess, you know, <laughs> do we have input here? Do we not have input? It was a very different kind of feeling. Absolutely. And, and often leaders feel like they've got to have the answer. So they'll come to a yeah. meeting, they'll say, this is the problem. This is what I think will fix it. Now you tell me what you think. And of course, everyone tends to sit there and says, no, we like your idea. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. So don't right? give the idea first. Let uh, put out the problem and say, what are your thoughts and listen? Absolutely. Yes. What, what a great story. And it is inspirational when you actually see it in action because yeah. you see a team that's empowered. And I just want to touch back on that caring aspect, sure. because I, I suppose part of that caring aspect is also making sure that you guys are ready for whatever it is that you're going to face. So whether that's yeah. being physically ready, being hard and mentally um, and all of that sort of stuff. So part of that caring process is actually going to be, I, I would imagine a little bit of that hard ass attitude to make sure that sure. you're equipped to get, to do the job that you've got to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's, uh, you, that's, that's a great, great point. And you're absolutely right. Uh, that's, um, they have to be, uh, it's, it's the combination, right? So they show you the, they show you the compassion and they know you have personal stuff you have to get taken care of, but at the same time, they know they have to, that you have to be trained and yeah. you got to be ready. And, you know, we call that environment, uh, it's a VUCA, it's, the, it's a V-U-C-A, it's an acronym for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it's kind of the premise of crisis leadership, because yeah. you're going to hit that stuff all the time uh, in the military. And I think about every organization on the planet has experienced that in the past six months with the pandemic, yeah. um, not expecting it, and, and bam, here we go. So you got to be prepared for those types of things. And yes, you're absolutely right. It's if you have to be, if you have to be a hard ass at times, you, then you got to be a hard ass. But when you're doing that, your, your people know that you care about them because you're all, you're not just always that person. Yeah. You're the whole package Yeah, and, and they'll get it. So Bo, in your journey, um, I would imagine there's been some inevitable troughs that you've faced where you've, um, things haven't worked out exactly, even though you had a zero defect <laughs> process yeah. in the White House. There were some things that maybe didn't work out. There was some uh, per perception of failure. Tell me about how you deal with that and what is your relationship with failure? Oh, so failure, failure is a part of life. Um, it's a part of, um, it's definitely a part of my life. And I, I used the term uh, fail forward. Yeah. So as long as you're going you pick yourself back up and you, and you keep moving forward and you don't let that uh, stop you from going after what it is you were going after. Uh, I had a, I had an experience where I think it was, it was one of the first times 
where I really had to dig deep and figure out who I was in that type of thing. Cause I was facing, I was facing real failure. Um, part of uh, my military career, I had the opportunity to go to airborne school and, you know, j- learn how to be a paratrooper and jump out of airplanes. And at that point in time, uh, I was around, I don't know, 30 years of age or so. And I had never experienced that type of physical, uh, brutal training as it was. Uh, the U.S. military sends all of their military forces to the same location. It's run by the Army. Um, but, you know, it's a few weeks long. But by the end of first, the first week, uh, I, was, um, I, I, was in, I was injured. I had, I had bruising starting on my hip because I had fallen down on the ground a thousand times and then got through the weekend with that. And the next week we, we did this training where like jumping off of a, a platform that was about uh, uh, 12 feet in the air. I don't know how many meters that is off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but it's, it's uh, about twice the, yeah. twice the height that I stand. Yeah. And um, so about yeah. four meters about four meters right? and you step off of that and you're hooked to this harness and a rope and the instructor lets the rope go and you fall down to the ground because you're practicing how to land. So when you actually jump out of the plane and you're in your parachute, you got to learn how to land because a combat parachute, you're falling pretty quickly, Mm. quicker than a normal, uh, normal parachute. Um, And by the end of week two, I mean, my whole left side looked like a slab of raw meat. Um, It was, it was rough. Um, And I would have had every reason to quit. Yeah. And say, I'm done. I, you know, and I don't think anybody would have held it against me. Just, they could have, I could have lowered my, my pants and say, look at that. Right. And uh, a serious injury going on. Uh, nobody would have probably said anything, but mm. I had to dig down and say, what do I want? Do I want yeah. this? Do I not want this? Do I want to really go back to, to my unit and my teammates uh, having failed uh, to make it through airborne school? Uh, so I stuck with it. I had to dig down. It's the most resilient, most grit I've ever had to dig through from a physical and mental perspective yeah. um, to make it through that. Uh, and that really helped me, I think, later in life over the last 20 plus years yeah. that uh, quitting and is, is not an option. Uh, if you set out to do it and, you, and it's something that you really want to do. Um, and if you have setbacks, then you just got to get back up, try to figure out what you did wrong and make changes and adjustments and move forward. So, Excellent. yeah. And I use all of that, Tony, and I'm a big <laughs> believer. I, I try to use all those experiences. I'm a yeah. big believer in after action reviews, yeah. um, whether you did a project or um, you, you met a sales goal or whatever making sure the team spends some time getting together to figure out, you know, what were they supposed to do? Yeah. What did they actually do? What did they accomplish? What could they have done better? Uh, so that you do recognize the failures along the way, but you learn from them and you move forward. So then you don't, because failing backward, in my opinion, would be you're commit you're, you're doing the same things wrong or yeah. you're failing the same for the same reasons over and over again. Yeah. Doing um, the same thing and continuing and to get the same poor results. So yeah, exactly. And in in a situation like the one you described, I love your stories, but but it's um you live with that quitting for the whole of your life, you and do. now you now you've got a story of celebration of how you overcame that um that pain, that anguish, that um that injury, and um, yep. you know there, there's a there, and that's you're not making that choice at the time. You're not saying right. I need I need a story to celebrate for the rest right. of my life. You're right. making a choice on what it is that you want, but um, but I, I, I've met so many people that just have regrets around something that they set out to do and then they, they face some obstacles and whether it was the first obstacle or the third and that they walked away from something that they genuinely wanted and now they're still paying that price mentally because they know that if they just had that little bit extra, they um, potentially would be in a better place. So, yeah, great story. Uh, I be- Yeah. I, I, I know people like that myself, um, try and try and try to help them through, um, and get past it. Yeah. Cause yeah. So leaders are readers. So what are you currently reading though? I have, um, I have multiple books. I keep books on my desk because I believe that as well. <laughs> leaders are readers and 
one of the things I set out and kind of like the mantra that kept me in it, kept my mind in it for writing my own book, yeah. um, which is a, in the professional nonfiction realm, was if this can help one person, I mean, try to keep it at the lowest common denominator. Yeah. If it can help one person, then it's worth me taking the time to write it. Because I think professional books are invaluable. Mm. And you can, you can, even if you get a few tips, one or, you know, a few tips that you yeah. didn't know before from the book and you spent, you spend a few dollars, 20 bucks on it. It's, it's well worth, it's an education, probably the cheapest education um, yeah. there is. So um, I have, uh, there was a gentleman, he runs an innovation center here. His name's Jeff DeGraff, um, the innovation code. So yeah. I'm reading the innovation code. I have Joyce Russell's uh, put a cherry on top. It's called generosity in life and leadership. Yeah. Um, she's actually coming on our podcast next month. Uh, I, I hadn't heard that book. I'll need to look that one up. Cherry on top. I love the title. Cher- put a cherry on top. Yeah. Um, yeah. Generosity in life and leadership by Joyce Russell. And then one of the best ones, uh, lunch meat and life lessons by Mary Lucas sharing a butcher's wisdom. So it's her story. Her father was a butcher yeah. and all that she learned in life and then took that into it. She's been a very successful uh, professional yeah. uh, and she's sold about a hundred thousand copies of this book. Um, and they're just fantastic. And what you can learn from them and these, you know, corporate uh, very, very successful corporate leaders today who have put their stories. It's their life. You know, Susan uh, Joyce did the same thing with her book. You know, it's a little bit about their life story and then lessons that they took along the way and putting their thoughts, uh, their thought leadership into all of that. Um, Yeah, those are what I'm going through now. And I love having authors on our, even on our podcast and the Bo and Luke show, because I get to read their books, (laughs) you know, Um, and and I, I think it's great. Excellent. Excellent. What are the traits that you've seen in great leaders and what are the, are they the same traits that we need from our leaders today? Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, num- number one, I think, I think you have to care. Like if I put in like the uh, top three, number one, you have to care and you have to show that you care genuinely. Yeah. Uh, I think you need to be uh, as competent as possible in uh, not just in your role as a leader, but whatever it is that you are trying to do and, and deliver that competency uh, because competency to me builds confidence. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then, and then just having awareness and I, and I, you got to have awareness of what's happening around you, what's happening with your teams. Um, maybe that's a byproduct of caring, Mm. Uh, but if you don't, you know, I'll give you an example of a, if it's okay, of a big difference between, um, leadership in the military and leadership that I've seen in the, in the corporate world, uh, in, in the military, uh, Tony, if you, if you were one of my soldiers, I would know everything about you. I'd know everything about your spouse. If you had a spouse your, or your mom and dad, your family. Um, and, and I would, I would talk to you about that. I would, I would know when something's bothering you. If you told me something was bothering you and you talked about, you know, something happening with your mom and dad, I would understand the situation. I would know their names, uh, and so forth. Uh, here that doesn't happen in the corporate world. And I think that starts with, you know, we have all these rules and regulations that you can't ask certain questions when you're hiring people. Um, But you got to kind of get through that part. And then when you start learning or you start working with folks, and I'm not saying intrude on their lives or you're not going out to the bar and drinking with them, but through, through conversation, through working with them, through listening, which we talked about earlier, key aspect, listening, uh, getting to know who they are uh, inside and out uh, helps you helps you be aware of what's happening with your team, what's yeah. impact. Yeah, and and hopefully allows you to pick up some of those unseen signs from people. If we see sudden, sudden little subtle shifts in their behavior or their attitude. Um, when we know more about them, when we've built that rapport, it really enables us to say, Hey, something's not quite right here. Let's go grab a cup of coffee and let's have a chat. And that's right. And and not to interrogate, not to go through that questioning style, but genuinely because you can sense that something's not quite right. So that's right. 
And I think that's, that's being aware and, and having good perception of what's happening with your, with your people um, so that you're not automatically making an assumption that, oh, their performance is down, they're not going to work out anymore, and we're yeah. going to have to replace them. That's, that's, yeah, that, to me, that's not leadership at all. Yeah. That's just lazy. Yeah, the, the first aspect for some leaders is always that underperformance route and will go down the performance management process when, when really there's usually a reason for the underperformance or the shift in behavior. And if they right. took some time, they can find that out. So, so right. by, what's the vision for you moving forward? Uh, the, the vision for me personally, um, I transitioned out of uh, normal corporate roles back in uh, uh, earlier in the beginning part of this year, literally just before COVID hit. And um, so me today, it's, it's executive coaching, leadership coaching, leadership development, um, business consulting, and I do uh, professional speaking. Yeah. So, so that's me uh, in a nutshell where I am today so that I can take everything that uh, I have learned, all of my lessons, and impart mm. them on individuals who could, who could use them. Yeah. Uh, and their organizations help themselves and their organizations uh, be better, know better, do better. Uh, because I think there's, um, I think there's a lot of people that want that and that are truly strive uh, to want to do better. Yeah. And I've always believed in uh, after I, well, I think I got a lot of mentoring and coaching internally <laughs> when I was in the army uh, yeah. from great mentors, but post military, you know, I've had several coaches myself Um always looking for that person who's probably, you know, five to 10 steps ahead of me, the, mm. those who have been there, they've done that. They have the lessons learned, the best practices. Great. Um, so I want to learn from them. Yeah. Uh, and then that's where I'm at. Right. And, and that's what I'm doing today. So out of everything that you've accomplished, what are you most proud of? Oh, professionally, uh, it has to be uh, my time at the white house for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I got to the end of that time, uh, when I was considering, uh, retiring from the army, it was really because, because the army had said, okay, you've been there long enough. We want you to go someplace else and do something different. And it was, well, I've kind of hit the pinnacle Mm -hmm. of my career working for the commander in chief. You can't get any, (laughs) you can't go any higher than that. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think I'm going to end on that note, uh, go out on a high. Yeah. Um, but through all of that, Tony, uh, when I, when I was in responsible and had, uh, had service members under my, under my leadership, uh, that was on, that was an honor. It was yeah. a privilege and it was an honor, um, to grow them, develop them, turn them into the army's next best leaders. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a real privilege to do that. And that would be so perfect if every leader had that same sort of um, sense of honor in developing their people and developing that next wave of leaders coming through. So that's right. Um, from my perspective, Bo, it's been a real honor for me to speak with uh, with yourself today. So is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? And this yeah. is your, this is your opportunity to jump on a soapbox, talk about your podcast, talk about your book. Yeah, sure. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we started uh, a colleague of mine who, who became one of my best friends today, Luke Kerrigan. Uh, we started a podcast called the Bo and Luke show came out in February of this year. Uh, all on the premise of doing uh, what I just said about uh, our tagline is to be better, know better, and do better. And uh, the first season, uh, it was let's let's get after it with the premise of don't stop, get up every day, keep going after your dreams, don't don't quit. And we had amazing guests with inspirational stories um, where they've made it to the to the professional sports arenas, they've made it to the C suite. But they had a lot of hiccups and the ups and downs and challenges along the way from the time they were kids, and they just never quit. And that's what we wanted to impart on the audience. And now we're in season two, and it's let's learn something. And we've, we've, got, we've just been blessed with some amazing guests on our show and uh, the life lessons. So it's, it's not just the get after it. It's the life lessons that they've learned, yeah. and they're imparting on our audience. So uh, it's the Bo and Luke Show. Bo is spelled B-O, uh, theboandlukeshow.com. Uh, you can, it's our website, but from there you can get to 
uh, easily get to the listening platforms where the podcast uh, uh, is at and where you can listen from. Excellent. And then, yeah. And, and then if you're interested in another professional book on your bookshelf, uh, from the battlefield to the White House to the boardroom, it's available on Amazon. Um, and it's available on the podcast website and my personal website if you want a signed copy, which is robertbrabo.com. Uh, I go by Bo, but my real name's Robert. Um, so the website's robertbrabo.com. Yeah. Uh, you, you can order a signed copy from there. And hey, if you need help, if you want to talk, you know what's great? We have Zoom like yeah. we're doing now. We can do video conferences across the world. I love it. Excellent. Bo, oh, it's been an absolute honor and a privilege for, for, for myself to have you on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Join the group of people impacted by seriously simple stuff to get you unstuck. The first book by Tony Coach Curl. Available at Amazon, Tony's Simple Stuff provides the tool for people to master your life and aspirations. 20% of every book sold supports Carter's cause. So I took a lot away from that discussion with Bo. And one of the, the real big uh, takeaways for me was the aspect of caring for your team. Now, when he shared his experience with a younger military leader that he reported to, it really helped the scene uh, for, for myself and hopefully others to help others understand the full repertoire of leadership skills that are cons- constantly needed. Now, caring for your team is not some f- soft, fluffy skill that goes against ingrained behavior. It's a skill that's hard and difficult to master. But the benefits are clear. And being a caring leader isn't about being soft and pampering your people. It is about caring for your people. And that means a lot of things, including ensuring that they are best equipped to deal with what it is that they're going to face in their role, in their lives, in the world in in general. So how do we care for people and not allow them to be best equipped to deal with whatever it is that life's going to throw at them? Now, I often ask leaders what leader has had the most impact of them on them during their career. And then I'll follow up with what leader then were they most successful under. And often there's a disconnect. Often the one that they've had the most, that's been most impactful, isn't the one that they've had the most success under. Now, often the one that's generated success was more harder, more challenging, they had a greater belief in the potential of the person and they chose to stretch you. And that's caring. That is really caring because that's making sure, ensuring that you're going to deliver what it is that your potential, that that you have with your potential. That's true caring. But often we might misread those circumstances and we place our own slant on it, we put our own perspective, our own perception on it. And we might call those people tough, challenging, and it may really challenge us at times to the core. But the reality is that often we'll be stretched by people because they've got a greater belief in us, in you, than what maybe you have. So building rapport with your team is incredibly important as a leader but building trust and rapport with your leader, with your direct report, is just as important. As we mentioned during the podcast, you can contact Bo at robertbrabo.com and that's probably the best way to to connect with uh, Bo and to find out a little bit more about what he is doing. And as you know, in today's disruptive world, good leadership skills will always stand you in great stead. If you're looking to build better leadership skills, check out the Today's Leader website now at todaysleader.com.au. Our website showcases our podcast and our magazine. And we're pleased to say that Masterminds are now available commencing in 2021. It's supported by our network sites, our partner sites, 
Today's leader is truly a collective mindset for the leaders and entrepreneurs of today, forging the path of success for tomorrow, the mindset to make a difference and the ability to create an impact. Now, Think and Grow Business hosts our Today's Leader Masterminds, Think and Grow Business, where we focus on personal, professional and business growth. Book your free 30-minute discovery call at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. The Coach Call Academy has over 78 programs to help you build a better you. Join for just $1 for the first month. The academy that equips you and enhances your mindset, your leadership, and your business skills. Check it out at thecoachcallacademy.com. You are standing stronger, braver, and wiser. Don't forget the golden rule. You know what it is. Just don't be an asshole. I'll see you next time.